Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is O-Culture, where we know it was Berenstein all along, you history rewriting motherfuckers. I am Ryan Peverly, your master of ceremonies, the quantum mysticist, engineering this melodic Mandelic effect all over those ear holes. And you know we penetrate in them at 528 hertz, and you know... You're catching something fierce from this sonically transmitted discourse, if you feel my flow. And speaking of that, let's get right into that flow state this week. We've got a YouTuber named SMQ.AI in the house. SMQ has been making videos for the past few months that present his personal philosophy and cosmology based on one simple idea, that we all died in 2012. Of course, a lot of strange things happened that year, if you recall. You had the supposed end of the Mayan calendar, which seems like bullshit now. You also have false flag events, such as Sandy Hook, which woke up a lot of people, this guy included. You also had the supposed discovery of the God Particle by scientists at CERN. And the Curiosity rover supposedly landed on Mars in 2012. And then there's this potentially prophetic quote from Terence McKenna that SMQ brings up that has to do with history ending in 2012. And then there's this thing called the Mandela Effect, which seemed to really ramp up around this time. And that's the basis for SMQ's YouTube videos. They construct his cosmology of our collective death in 2012 via subjects such as the aforementioned Mandela Effect, and also things like cymatics, the cyclical nature of time, CERN, transhumanism. We touch on all these topics and more in this conversation, including some other things like creativity and muses and art as magic and vertical thinking versus lateral thinking. This is probably one of the more thought-provoking episodes that we've done to this point, and we do sort of ease into it, but once we get going, we gone. So hang on, because this pod is casting off into a reality where time and art are the only currencies that matter. Enjoy. SMQ, thanks so much for being here. No, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Um, I'm fairly new to your work, though. Uh, you know, a lot of the guests that I've talked to so far, I have been fans of them for, you know, going on years for some of them. And But you are someone who I just stumbled across uh, on, on Twitter, actually, and I don't even know where or how. But obviously, the content of your Twitter feed, which led me to your YouTube channel, is quite intriguing. But before we get into all that, I'd like to talk about just you. Some of the listeners may not know who you are and, and what it is you do, so maybe you could just give us a, a brief sort of primer on yourself. Okay. I suppose the the way that I would say it right now is I mostly concentrate my efforts um, through YouTube currently. I try to get out a video once a week or so. I consider my YouTube channel sort of a living, breathing kind of um, apparatus that I use to kind of channel talent through that that kind of morphs into a more or less kind of mosaic of different ideas and approaches to things that I believe in and also philosophies that I abide by. And I try to make that channel something that's fun and interesting and thought provoking for people. And I hope to grow it in interesting and in different ways. Um, this isn't a bad critique on a lot of channels, but they, they kind of a lot of YouTube channels, I would say the majority, they get an, a niche going and, and they stick with it and they, they sort of, they kind of have a beat going. And, and a lot of those channels that I, I, I very much, I, I'm into and I'm, I'm very interested in. And what I want to do is kind of deviate from that and kind of grow it and kind of mutate it into, into something more and more creative and interesting as I go on. And again, like I just said, for people who aren't familiar with my work, I primarily started out with talks on the Mandela Effect and theories that I had on the Mandela Effect because I found it to be probably one of the most interesting things right now going going around YouTube and, and really most of social media and Twitter. And, and I found some of the some of the folks that were into it, you know, the least abrasive and kind of more open and, and, and certainly, certainly by far the most interesting people that I've come across. So 
The channel originally started with me um, just talking simply unscripted, and this was back, back in February, unscripted on my thoughts on the Mandela effect and my theories on what happened and why it is why it's occurring. And quickly, by my second video, it had exploded to 90 to 100,000 views within a month or two. Um, and the video had to deal with uh, the Mandela effect being sort of the world collectively coming to grips with a mass extinction event that happened in 2012 and that we're living in the afterlife right now. Now, I half did that as kind of a thought experiment, and I half did it as as kind of my own my own way of exploring different creative ideas within the Mandela effect. And I think the Mandela effect is, even if you don't believe it, I think the idea of the Mandela effect kind of reshaping and refocusing what you think reality is, is important and thought provoking and very fun and interesting. And I'd been a creative person my whole life, although my job officially is IT, I, I code for a living, but there's even creativity in that. But I just wanted the channel to sort of start off just exploring that and what that is. And long before I had heard of the Mandela effect, I had, you know, I, I was writing about things that were sort of related to that. You know, reality as it presents itself to us isn't always what it really is. And I've, I've always known my entire life there's, there's a lot more going on around us than, than we can perceive. And, you know, I, I bring it up in other videos, examples as, you know, what a human being can perceive, you know, the kind of light we can see and, and the, you know, the, everything in the electromagnetic spectrum is, is very, is, is very narrow in focus in terms of what we're, we can perceive. And even the instruments that we are, that we create through science, even those are faulty in terms of what they're able to what they're able to pick up on and perceive. So I thought playing around with those kinds of ideas and, and incorporating the Mandela effect with those would be something that would be fun and interesting and, and something people could really get into. And sure enough, the second video, people started to really get into it, debate it, a lot of trolling with me, and that was fun. I expected that, and that's part of the fun of it is, you know, someone calling you insane or schizophrenic or whatever it may be and trying to use that as a pejorative, and which I don't, but, you know, that's that's fine. And so I started to do a series of videos, and what I tried to do is create a um, an internal world and kind of an internal environment that started to incorporate all kinds of other fringe ideas that were out there. I started to address, you know, the Mandela effect and the mass extinction event in 2012 to AI, to, you know, uh, transhumanism, to to anything under the sun that I could find. And I started to build a catalog of, of talks because there were no video to this at this point. When I started getting more into the my first or second video for the channel, I noticed another channel had popped up that was quote unquote exposing me as being a show, which to this day... The channel's gone, but I, I'm not exactly sure who or, or what I was shilling for exactly because I wasn't promoting a product. In no way do I work for the government um, or have I ever. So I wasn't exactly entirely sure what that was. And then what happened was the channel grew in intensity. And, and by this point, understand, I had one video that was breaking 100,000. My other videos were doing pretty well as well, getting anywhere from, you know, 1,000 to 5,000 views. I ended up finally pulling most of um, the talks and the videos up through June, from February to June, was the channel began to um, frighten me. And I, I also began to worry about the validity of what this person was doing. And that was saying that there was someone in their lives was taking my channel literally and, and was becoming destructive because of what the content I was putting out on YouTube. Now, I knew that from the earlier videos that they had put out, they put out a total of, I think, eight videos, I believe it was, and each one growing more and more in, in, in intensity, attempting to dox me. You know, so I started to worry about my own safety and I they published a series of texts that were going back and forth. And I, 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 I didn't know if they were real or not, but the person in the text were saying they were believing and taking literally what I was saying and that they were feeling, you know, they, they expressed negative feelings that I'm not going to get into. But I thought, you know, on the one percent chance that this is something, then 
this is not what I want, wanted my channel to be. I wanted it to be something fun and interesting where people could debate ideas. And, and I would say 99.9%, .9%, even the negative people, they had entirely great conversations with one another. And it turned out to be fun most of the time with people who either got into the Mandela effect or even debated what it was. And, and that's what I was trying to, to, you know, trying to do, trying to foster that kind of really cool environment. But, I thought on the off chance that if if my channel and what I was saying would negative negatively affect someone in any way, that that's not what I'm about and what I was trying to do. So what I went ahead and did was I privatized the videos. And then by that point, I was getting into video anyway. And I thought, you know, I originally my original mission statement was to take the, the channel into all different directions. So I thought, I would keep the original thread of the Mandela effect, keep the original thread and the, the original sort of spirit of, of this cool idea of representing the afterlife in, in, a, in a way and in a context that I don't think I've ever come across and, and kind of go with that, with kind of a, a talk going and, and juxtapose that with really cool videos and start working on my, my craftsmanship towards visuals. So um, since then, I've been working on videos like that, and I've, I've loosened up on the 30 to 45-minute talks and gotten more into one-and-a-half to two-minute videos where I can take a narration piece, add video to it, and then I've adopted this character of this teddy bear mask wearing a suit with a purple tie. And um, I think from there, I think we're pretty much caught up. The teddy bear character is, is quite intriguing to me, and we may get into that a little later. To just comment on your YouTube issues, I guess, um, it's uh, it's unfortunate that you felt the, the need because of the reaction to take those videos private because they're really, as you've described them, creative and interesting and thought-provoking. And just to stay on creativity for one moment because that is something that, that I'm interested in in terms of I've been, I constantly urge people in my own life to create things because I, I, it brings me great joy. And I think there's a, a good sort of funnel of, of energy into, you know, the creation process. But you have a personal philosophy on creativity that I'd like you to share with people if you don't mind. Yeah. I mean, I think that if anyone is, you know, what I'm about to say is part me, but mostly my inspiration comes from this book called The War of Art. Um, it's by uh, Stephen Pressfield. It's just a really cool book that I've had for years and years and years. And part of what the book believes and says and part of what I believe and I say is I believe that creativity is 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 something metaphysical and, and mystical and magical and that it's something outside of ourselves. And I think that every creator, whether it's a, f a film person or a musician or a writer or, or anybody that, that can bring something beautiful from nothing, I think you all know that, and I think we all know that these ideas come to you. You don't really create these ideas. So as I believe and as the book states, you know, we, we, we have to respect talent and, and your muse because it's chosen in you. And I believe that we act sort of as, as, as transmission stations to bring these ideas into being and into existence so in order to be a creator really what what you are is you're kind of you're kind of conductor of the train and and you can guide and and, and you can shape it and you can you know decide the journey that the train is going to go on but you didn't create the train and i think that oftentimes talent passes through or a creative idea will pass through a person and they'll get it down and they'll jot it down and then they'll grow it and and a lot of themselves will be in that but also too i think a lot of that has to do with the world we can't see and i think it has to do with you know higher guides and muses and and understanding your muse and, and appreciating it and i think a lot uh, of what we see particularly with creative people is that there's a destructive side to it. And I think it's because we haven't been properly educated in understanding what the creative process is and how to respect it and how to have great respect for being chosen and having also great respect for understanding where your limitations are as a human being, not as a creator, and saying that um, oftentimes you can almost see it in someone when the talent is bigger than they are. 
You know, it's almost like an intuition. You can see, you can see it, and you can see that it that it could end up being a destructive force on that person. And therefore, oftentimes, I think you know, there's entire swaths of YouTube that go after either Hollywood or they go after creative people, and they toss around all these things. And I think it's a misunderstanding, and it's because there's really been no no study or no schooling, at least that I know of, of being able to harness creativity and use it in a positive way while not damaging the vessel that 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 is transmitting that creativity into the world. And for all of the creativity we have out there and for all the artistic input we have out there, we have many, many casualty stories of great artists and musicians and painters and writers that ended up with you know negative experiences or, or tragic deaths or things of that nature. And I think that a lot of that has to do with this head first you know, dive that an artist will go into once they realize they're creative or, or they're intuitive and they don't and they don't really take the time and oftentimes it will hit you and you won't really have a choice, you know, but and then there are other times where you're you're allowed to grow up and be more introspective with your muse and you're allowed to be um and allowed to grow with it. And that's truly where you get something, you know, that isn't as destructive to that person. Um, and I truly believe this. And it's unfortunate that, you know, simply because the outcome for the artist happens to be a um, negative, that we can cast, you know, their art or all of the artists before them and after them in a negative light. And I, I think that's kind of a shame because I think that, you know, art is the butt of a joke for a lot of people. But I think art is a form of magic. And I think that art is a very powerful form of magic. And I think that with a lot of other magic, it's whether it's chaos or ceremonial or, or whatever kind of magic you're talking about, there is always the law of intent. And there, there's always, you know, what your intent is and what you want to bring into the world and how you change it physically or, or a person or an event or whatever it is versus art. It's brought through you and to you. It's something that's almost like the reverse of that. It's almost like you have changed from something outside that's been channeled to you and that you're sending that out. And regardless of what your intention is, oftentimes, particularly if the talent and the art is big enough, it's going to, no matter how much you try, it's going to come out in the way that it meant to come out. And oftentimes I think there's just always one idea of one lamp. You know, there's only one lamp and everything else is a copy of a lamp or one pair of sunglasses and there's all just copies of that i think that the thing that art does is it, it pulls all of those things together into something that's original and then it passes through you and i think part of the process that where it can be um destructive is when i first started writing or, or first started pinning ideas they were really they weren't very good but you know eventually i started to get into it more and more and more and they started getting better and to where now with my sort of spiritual philosophy of the power of now, I'm able to almost meditate constantly and have and be able to shelve ideas, shelve concepts and, and creative ideas and shelve them in, in order. And then as I need them, I can pull them off the shelf and then dispense them as I want. And that's a really cool place to be if you're a creative person. But if you have that ability already and it comes right to you and let's say you're 14 and a prodigy, you know, that can be a very negative thing if you're not, if you don't have a proper guide to understand what talent is. And I think with a lot of other ways of thinking in terms of like political thought or other kinds of thought, there are entire, there are entire schools out there to train you for these kinds of things. And yes, there is art classes, but the art classes, they don't necessarily address the psychological side of the artist and how to cope with talent and how to cope with these things. So um, that's sort of my philosophy on that. Well, your philosophy jives pretty well with the idea of the brain being a receiver of, of consciousness. I mean, I'm sure that you're familiar with, with that theory, right? Oh, of course. Absolutely. Definitely. And, you know, and, and to build on that, I mean, it's an idea of it's almost like working a muscle is working that circuitry for that that transmitter. And if you have too much of an overload of talent going through that 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 circuitry, your transmitter in your brain, 
you know, it, it obviously you fry the circuit. And I, I, if I, if I wasn't doing this on the fly, I'd probably make it sound more poetic, but I, I think you get my point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This makes me wonder then, can creativity be learned? Is it something that everyone has within them? Is everyone capable of receiving that, that sort of creative transmission? Or is this something that's only reserved for a certain type of person? Questions like that is exactly why there, there should be an entire school of thought or an entire commission or committee or something that explores things like this, because I don't really have an answer for that. I know that everyone can be creative. I know everybody has the ability to be creative. Of course, I think that's you know inherent in every single human being. Now, whether or not you have talent that will actually reshape perception on a small or a large scale, that's something entirely different then. And I, I'm not entirely sure everyone has that ability. Just like everyone doesn't have the mathematical genius to do a Jack Parsons kind of launching or or, or, or the economic genius someone has that uh, they have a preternatural understanding of, of international finance. I, I don't think everyone can get to that level. However, everyone can balance their checkbooks or everyone can be maybe a regional power in real estate or something like that. So I think there's different levels of it. But in terms of really understanding it, I mean, I'm, I, I, I don't have the answer to that. I don't know. You had a, an example or some sort of analogy a few minutes ago about, you know, there's only one lamp and then everything else is a, a copy of it. I was wondering, for some reason, as soon as you said that, I thought like, oh, shit, like are human beings maybe the same. Maybe there's just one human and then everybody else is just a copy of that one human. Have you ever thought of that? Yeah, absolutely. That's why we have, you know, Fibonacci numbers, 55, 144, 233, sacred geometry, all of that. Yeah, it's all it's all a copy and it's all it's all mathematics. It's it's all Fibonacci. It's all math uh, that also gets into cymatics and sound, how you're able to capture different patterns within cymatic sounds, depending on, you know, the, the, the kind of material you use and why Fibonacci and Fibonacci numbers are prevalent throughout the human body and why Fibonacci numbers are prevalent throughout basically all of existence. So yeah, it's absolutely, it's a print press of, of everything. So sure, of course, I believe that. That's a great sort of introduction to your work then like the actual videos that you've created on youtube i know they're private i know people can't see them right now but let's talk about the ones that you did create a lot of the work stems thematically from one idea and it is the mandela effect but even beyond that it's the idea that we all died in 2012 so I'm, I'm really interested in hearing you explain you know what brought you to that theory to that idea first of all Well, first I want to say, as a disclaimer, again, I'm not a citizen journalist. I'm not going to go down a a list of facts of why I think we all died in 2012. What I will say is that the idea of dying in 2012, I think, came to me with, it was, it kind of came to me backwards and I worked backwards from it of, and and I got it and I, I, I was wondering if I was going to get this in the comment section. I did. Thousands and thousands of comments I got on this. And it was like, well, if we're dead, well, then why this? If this, then else. If this, then else. And it's, well, if we're dead, then why don't we see people who died before? So I don't see dead relatives. Or why are babies still being born? And I thought, my God, man, I I really stumbled on something really wonderful here. And the, the idea of being dead in 2012 is so shaking and rattling to people because what it does is and and why it's so important to really think about that is i bring it up you know what did you expect from the afterlife and what what do you call the afterlife and what do you call life are are you are you entitled to see everyone the dead relatives and harps and 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 you know angels and you know what what is it you expect as if as if life the great reward of life is all, all will be revealed in the afterlife and we'll all be together and and you know we'll, we'll, we'll all have it figured out and i thought what if what if we're already here okay we're already gone and the frustration that we feel in life continues through the afterlife the, the frustration of, of the mundane things that take up 99% of our lives, of waiting in line, of, of dealing with, you know, your peers, whether it be socially or at work, the, the frustration of not having your favorite brand of chip whenever you go to the store and knowing there's nowhere else to go because it's 10 o'clock at night or whatever it may be. Just these mundane, thing, a flat tire in the rain. And 
I think that if life, for as magical and and as as miraculous as it is, a lot of it is very mundane, and a lot of it there's a whole lot of nothing happening. And I thought to myself, what if the afterlife is exactly the same way? There isn't, you know, there's so many, and it's so important, and there's so many philosophies built around it. And every single one of those philosophies in some way have something in common in terms of things will be revealed to you. But what if there's, there's, there's not? And what if it's already happened? And that, and I thought that was such a playful idea to build on. What a, what a great thing and a thought provoking thing that would be. I, I sent you a list of the unlisted uh, videos, and I don't know if, if I included the, my Jacob's Ladder one. Throughout film history, they've, they've, they've touched on this, but not really kind of fleshed it out into a, a kind of usable philosophy. But, um, films like Jacob's Ladder, The Others, Things like that. They, they, they kind of hint at things like that, but that's what I wanted to, that's what I wanted to sort of kind of spark the conversation about it. And not to mention from there, it would became such a rich environment to kind of work in anything else that's relevant right now, such as transhumanism or AI or, or, you know, whatever else it may be at the time. I thought how time travel works. Is the universe against you? You know, why does the universe have to be for you? And what is the nature of consciousness? Is it only human consciousness? Can things that we considered inanimate or, or something like that be as conscious or maybe have a greater consciousness than we do? Um, you know, cymatics. I mean, it, it got to where I was on such a roll. It was, it was really great the videos they do sort of have this crescendo like about them they just sort of build and build and build i really enjoy them and part of the the concepts that i really enjoyed back to the the meat of your ideas it really does hinge on cymatics and and knowing first of all what cymatics is so for those of the listeners that don't know could you maybe give a nice description of what cymatics is and and how it plays a role into your theory here uh, sure. Yeah. Um, cymatics, kind of the, the short end of it is it's the study of how, how kind of sound can affect matter and how sound itself may play a bigger role in our material world than we previously thought. And, um, I think if anyone wants to look up cymatics, it's a lot of the intro stuff that's on YouTube is, is, is really great stuff and it really gets you in there. And I think that just as you were looking into and we started talking about, you know, parasymatics, it's almost limitless with what you can do with cymatics. And it's basically the study of sound right now. They're obviously they're, they're doing experiments on cymatics and how it changes water, how it changes water into these universal patterns, which by the way, are Fibonacci patterns or Fibonacci compliant patterns, how it changes sand into all sorts of, of, of shapes and patterns that you'll see in nature. And then that started to bring me into the idea of everything is sound. I mean, there's references to how existence was spoken into existence, you know, whether it be biblical or Eastern philosophies or whatever, most of it has is hinging around how powerful sound is and i think cymatics is 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 our first step toe into that to where the world around us and and the the existence that we see around us is is a lot less set than you would think it is and i think that a lot of the military applications they have for sound right now is is far more advanced than they're letting on um i have no proof of this i have to put that out there I was, I've been called a shill so many times, so I, I have no I have no inside knowledge that anyone else would have. But I think that the the study of sound and the study of sound in, in ways that it affects the human body, particularly because the human body is mostly water, is far, far more profound than people give it credit for. As I say in my videos, we live in a world of sound and a, a world where physical things are, are depending on, on tones and frequencies, um, they, they, they change and they, they morph and they, they become acidic or, or not. Everything about them changes. And I think that this probably harkens back to ancient times and sort of the, the, the math and science that we only get glimpses of that they had back then. So that's sort of a real quick kind of go over of what cymatics is about. But I encourage everyone, you know, get into it. It's, it's a great subject and it's a lot of fun. 
Well, and that's also just the general idea that, that Tesla talked a lot about when he was alive, was that if you want to know the nature of the universe, think in terms of frequency and vibration. And that's, that's exactly what we're talking about with cymatics. I, I don't know if the term cymatics was around when he was, but I would consider him the first mainstream scientist to sort of stumble upon that. Oh, yeah. And, and what you said, absolutely, particularly Tesla. And I think all this is, is really we finally have a handle. You know, we have a, we have sort of, we filled the variable for something that, that, that can safely house all, all these ideas and we can house it under sort of the idea uh, of the name cymatics now. And it's something where all these different kinds of sciences and, and theories and, and everything out there that, that we can weave together, whether it be hard science, whether it be the occult or anything else, I think it can weave together nicely with this sort of handle that we have, this variable called cymatics now. So yeah, it's kind of a tent top. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, in one of your videos, you have this quote where you say, in cymatics, everything is an echo. I thought that was really cool because uh, the way you describe it. This also plays into the Mandela effect, which we haven't really gotten into yet, but there really is a lot of sort of setup to this, and I apologize if we're taking a while to get into it, but I would like you to explain what you mean by everything is an echo and how that does play a role in what we've been talking about with cymatics and then even the nature of reality and time and subjects like sure. that. Yeah. Um, and before that, what I wanted to do is to help people understand uh, where I'm coming from. There's there's a school of thought out there, and it talks about vertical thinking. And mostly everyone on the planet uses this kind of vertical thinking where it's kind of the scientific method where, you know, we have to come to the conclusion and, and consensus of, of what is the right answer, okay? Then there's lateral thinking, which is a newer kind of thinking, and Lateral thinking, it comes to the idea that we don't have to come to consensus and there could be many right ideas. And I think some of the friction and some of the frustration and some of the sort of churning that I had in some of the comment sections with them not wrapping their, their, their heads around the idea of what, what if we are, what if life and death and all of these things isn't what you think it is, is because you're sort of challenging their ideas of what is the one right idea. Everyone wants the one right idea so they can put it to bed, go home and forget all about it. And what I, what, what I'm trying to do, particularly with cymatics and using echoes and, and things of that nature is to get more lateral thinking, meaning it's more intuitive based thinking and that a lot of reasons why a lot of um, civilizations, they, they fail and they come and they go is because they get into this pattern of, of vertical thinking and where we've got to find the one right answer or, or even if we don't, we're going to agree to call that the one right answer and we're going to hold up the tablet and everyone's going to say that's it, that's doctrine and that's dogma and then we're going to walk away. And also, by the way, to, to choke out any, any kind of creative expression as well and any dissent as well, you're also only going to use this one method this one method, and never mind that this one method, let's call it the scientific method that we use, that it doesn't even universally work on what we call science nowadays. Now, that's a long way around to the echoes, but I think that I wanted to put that in there to say, just because I talk about something this way doesn't necessarily mean I'm attacking a person's worldview. What I'm saying is that there can be multiple right answers. There doesn't have to be one singular right answer. And particularly with these large, ubiquitous ideas of life and death and the meaning of life and why are we here and, you know, these things going back to the ancients, there's no answer to really to any of those things. So it's really kind of an open field where you can question anything and everything. And I think for me, Echoes was a really eloquent way to sort of build on cymatics and build on the idea that we died in 2012. Because the way I tried to put it all together was if you take a calm body of water, like let's say a pond, okay? And let's say you take a, a, a rock and you throw it in that pond and, that, and then it disrupts it and then there's ripples out from that event. The mass extinction event is, is what I'm talking about when the rock hits, what we are is we're one of those echoes rippling out slowly into uh, dissipation. And as we do, all of the constructs that we've created in terms of belief systems, in terms of, of, of thoughts, in terms of economic systems, in terms of linear thinking, all of those things will begin to unravel. And all of those things will begin to dissolve. And we will come to a dissolving consensus. And I think lateral thinking is a great way to 
sort of understand that right now. And I think part of the frustration a lot of people have with the actual reality we live in is that everyone's looking for that vertical answer, that one right answer. And I think that it's either, you know, we're getting too sophisticated to understand that. We all have, are too opinionated to come to a kind of one right answer. Or I don't know what it is, but I think using echoes and sort of as an echo ends, it gets more and more faint. As it becomes more and more faint, that echo has less control over the sound around it. And I thought, what a what a great sort of delivery system to kind of get that idea out there. Yeah, absolutely, man. And you, know, you touched on something there about things dissipating as the echo dissipates. And you kind of set that up as, as the reason that that reality itself is becoming stranger. And I thought that was a really good take on it because I've had casual conversations with people where, you know, we'll be talking about something and then one of us will pause and then we'll just be like, man, like life's really gotten strange. You know, just like the things that are happening in the world, even just on the surface are just so strange these days. You sort of set that up with a a similar explanation, you know, just about how these echoes are dissipating and that, that sort of reflects our consciousness doing the same thing. And then that means that everything around Around us sort of just kind of weakens and then fades i'm trying to understand are you saying that that process ended in 2012 or that process began in 2012 well one of the reasons why i picked 2012 was because of um i don't know if you're familiar with terence mckinnon's work and his time wave uh his time wave zero stuff mm-hmm. yeah go ahead it, yeah it basically history ends at 2012 and then obviously there was the whole build-up thing at 2012 and things have gotten steadily weirder since 2012 so i decided to pick 2012 because everything is, and, and it has, and you know the Mandela effect has been growing, and whether or not it's it's mass disbelief or it's some kind of hysteria, everyone who's whatever sphere you're in, whatever part of 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 the intellectual world or, or you know that you're in, whether it's politics, whether it's economics, whether it's whatever you want to call it, the occult, things are getting weird and they're getting strange, and it's getting to where it's no longer you can't ignore it anymore. So I, I thought that bringing all of these things together and sort of using that, that, that time, time wave zero philosophy would be kind of a cool way to bring it all together into something coherent and, and fun and creative. And I think that if you start looking up lateral thinking, horizontal or lateral thinking versus vertical thinking, you'll be able to weather this much better and be able to understand it because if you, it's a very bad time for people that want to live in absolutes. This is not your time if you're if you're someone who lives and dies by absolutes because that I don't know whatever you want to assign yourself to those absolutes are 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 probably pretty much gone. The echo is fading and it's dissipating and whether or not we're in the same kind of life we had or it's something different, I think we all know that something bizarro is happening. It's interesting that you know we've been talking about lateral thinking here for the last few minutes i I didn't know that term before I stumbled across your work, to be honest. But it does remind me of a, I had a really intimate conversation with a friend recently, and I encouraged her to to think more flexibly because she was kind of stuck in that rut of there's only one way, there's only one answer, you know, that, that very vertical way that you've been talking about. And I use the term flexible, but I, I think it's the same thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's exa- And it's funny that people, they're, they're, they're relying more now on their intuition and I think that has a lot to do with the survival mechanism. And that could play into, as, quote, the, the echo dissipates, you know, that echo, rep- a strong echo represents, you know, when it was strong and, and, and there, were, there were bedrock notions that were unchallengeable and, and there were bedrock things that you just, there were third rails everywhere and you didn't touch that third rail. Well, that's all gone and it's all dissolved. And that's why I call it dissolving consensus because it's, it's just not the same. I mean... Everything about the world is getting stranger, and it's getting stranger by the minute. So I think that, you know, whatever whatever you terminology you start with, I think we're all arriving at the same point. And I think people who are becoming more hostile and more angry, they have yet to sort of grasp this idea that the 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 notions that you had of of the way it should be versus the way it is outside of what you think. They're, they're, they are they're exclusive of one another. And I think one of the most powerful things you could recognize to calm yourself down is that 
the world and everything else is going to do what it wants to do, regardless of what your morality is and regardless of what you think is right and wrong. And regardless of how big of a bully pulpit you have and how much you can sort of wrangle people into to or if you were able to do that, those days are done. And and I think that if you can get your head around that and if you can just accept that, there will be a lot more internal peace. And if you do that, you'll actually start seeing more of, of these changes and you'll start seeing the bigger picture and how it's all happening. Now, I don't have a holistic reason why this is going on. I mean, like I said, I use the power of now. I don't believe in the future. I don't believe in the past. I only believe in right now. And this isn't some new agey, hippy dippy thing. This is a um, a series of exercises I use to, uh, as coping mechanisms for the world around me, and as and and as my life, you know, as I as I explore adulthood, and as my life gets stranger, and everyone else's life around me gets stranger, I I use this power of now as a um, a kind of practical a practical method for sort of living living in this world. And I think part of that frustration is everyone is so just strung up about the future, you know, what are we going to do in the future? And what about the future? And, and I think that, you know, the, the future we created in our own minds, you will never go to the future. No one and understand that no one is ever going to go to the future. You have never been to the future. I've never been to the future. No one has ever gone to the future and no one ever will because there's only now. Now there during now you have a series of cycles that, that take place and that's fine. You can observe those, but you're still now. You're still in the now, and you're still here right now. And you, you know, if you let your mind create scenarios that will never come to be, or at least not exactly like you look. Whatever scenario you think is going to happen, it's not going to happen that way. It may happen in a version of of what you may think, but it's not going to happen exactly the way you think. And ultimately, what you're doing is wasting your own energy and your own time worrying about something that doesn't exist, and that's the future. And I yeah. think the future is probably, the do- other than science, and, and that deals mostly with the future, is the dominant philosophy, it's the dominant government, the dominant religion of the planet. Um, we live in a theocracy of futurism, and um, everything else is a subset of that. Um, whether you're talking about Christianity or, or something else, it's all subset based on, on the future. And that has a lot to do with um, particularly Western religions having a, a linear time concept of there's a past, there's a present, and there's a future. And that has a lot to do with maintaining control through guilt of the past or maintaining control through fear and guilt of the future. And a lot of that has is, is fear and guilt based. And I think that a lot of the occult philosophies are out there that try to free people of fear and guilt and, and things like that. They are put down by the larger linear time-based um, religious philosophies because that, that frees your mind up to think of other things rather than you know worrying constantly about the future and thinking constantly about the past. So it's a very metaphysical thing for me. Yeah, I'm definitely on board with the power of now. It's something that, like you just alluded to, it's it's an idea that was sort of reinforced to me through my studies of occult philosophy that I've, again, is still very new to me just in the last few years of my life. But about the future, you know, this is not anything earth shattering here for me. But personally, I've seen and met and, and know several people who spend so much of their their time now worrying about hypothetical scenarios that aren't aren't real you know just situations they create in their mind and it leads to distress and disease or dis-ease as i like to call it now this power of now it also leads into a nice conversation about something else that, that you're interested the the nature of time which you were alluding to there with your talk about how religions have this this linear timeline that they they sort of you know shove down everybody's throat with their dogma but i think before i want to talk about that i, I want to go back to the 2012 topic just for a moment because there was an event in 2012 that that happened that received worldwide news coverage and it was something that i actually i was working for a newspaper at the time and i i wrote a column about this event and it was the discovery of the higgs boson particle by cern and you've talked about this before i'm curious how you think this may play a role in in what happened in 2012 yeah um you know and and again i'm not a journalist and i'm not here to present myself as a a um 
an expert. This is just my philosophy on this. I know with a lot of science, it's kind of a, um, a folk, it's an authoritarian approach to science. You know, those scientists, they know best and it's really, it, it's really more powerful than government. I, I know a lot of people go on about the monetary system and I can appreciate that, but I really think that science is, is a very, uh, it's very much an authoritarian system. And the fact that you hear about it all the time. There were there were dissenting, you know, voices whenever they, they let off the first atomic bomb. They had no idea what they were gonna do. They had no idea what it was gonna do to the planet. And yet, you know, we supposedly live in a democracy, but we had no vote in whether or not they were gonna set that thing off. And not to mention we had no vote of the ramifications of, of what was gonna happen in the future of what that ha- what what was gonna happen. And science has done that. It's it has free reign, it's completely arrogant, and it's a it's it's an authoritarian system, and and it also is so concerned with the future. Note that it, it's always about the future with science, and yet it claims to be the authority. But if you take scientists and science, what it believed 100, 200, 300 years ago, we now know that's gibberish for the most part. Victorian science is is gibberish for what that we understand what science is now. All we're doing is is continuing to clean up the fallout of science constantly. So that's why I say technology, oftentimes, all it is 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 the pollution of science that they sell to us as advancement. The technology that we get to better our lives, those are just, they find that by accident, most of it. It's, it's, an, it's an incidental thing. And it's usually only used for a military application that they sort of figure out a way to monetize. And then we finally get it when they're, whenever they've moved on to something more advanced. So science itself is, is, is malevolent for the most part, you know, and, and I think that, yes, you can look at medicine and you can look at all these other things, but a lot of that is caused by the environment from fallout from science. And I think that I lost my train of thought. What were we talking about? I get really worked up with science. So <laughs> Yeah, I had just asked you about CERN and the Higgs boson particle, and then that, that set you right. off on that. Yeah, no, okay, so anyway, so yeah, they found it. They found it in 2012. And I think um, something like that and finding something like that, eventually science is going to find something that's going to react to their findings. And I thought, what a perfect thing, the God particle, or, you know, it was it was the non-God particle, as some people joked. You know, eventually CERN or another organization is going to dig too deep and they're going to they're going to accidentally do a Fukushima, only it's going to be on the fabric of existence. It's going to happen eventually. And I thought everything that was going on in 2012 maybe the surgeons cut too deep particularly with finding this particle and particularly since things have gotten steadily weirder since then obviously i have no proof and i'm you know i I can't say that enough so um but i just thought what is it about this and, and why spend decades and decades and decades looking for this and and spend untold you know who knows how much money's been really been spent and now we're starting to hear about colliders popping up all over the place, and China is set to build them uh, uh, one of the biggest ones yet. And you know there has to be a lot more applications than what they proclaim it to be. You know their stance at CERN is that we did, you know we we knew since World War II we had a lot of these scientists and they were really smart, but they did mischievous things. So what we want to do is have them be able to do something that is not that that won't have a military application. I mean, really. There, there's there's no way that I can be convinced that, that that something like that is happening and that there's not some sort of military application in mind for this. There just isn't. Anytime that you, especially if you want to get to the level where you openly admit that you're looking for either the Big Bang or how reality itself is structured, or if you want to get really funky, where they talk about all online, you know, depending on what channel you go to, they talk about finding portals and black holes and, you know, it, you can run the gamut. If, if, if a tenth of this is true, there's, there's obvious uh, military applications to this. I mean, obviously. That's, that's what I think about, you know, the Higgs medicine and all that. So is time itself or what most people would consider time, you know, uh, however they want to describe it, could time itself or the idea of time that they've sort of shoved down our throats, could that also have some sort of military application? Because I've seen you describe time as a monetary construct. So obviously there's some there's some interest in it from a financial perspective, which usually can tie those two things into the same monster, you know. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, time is, time, the, the, the way in which time is taught to us is only taught to us to monetize us, you know, nine to five job, 
you buy insurance for the future, you buy medical insurance for the future, and you worry about time and you, you, you stick with the, you stick with the job and you, you work the better part of the day and the better part of your life preparing for a future where you're going to be old and then what money you have collected will be spent in your golden years as you die with incredibly expensive medical equipment in which you're going to die anyway. So it's a system where it's been created that you are you are born, you're going to work, you're going to work your entire life, then when you're ready to retire, you will get sick eventually, which is which is pretty soon after retirement. Let's say let's say you get a good run and let's say it's twenty to twenty five years after retirement. And the long span of a life that's that's a relatively short period of time, particularly because it's not your best years. You know, these aren't, these aren't, you know, your years where you're physically strong. These are years where you're breaking down. And during that process, all of your savings will be depleted through what? Through science, through worrying about medicine and the advances that medicine always, you know, promises us and, and really doesn't deliver on. And that's why I'm still a little skeptical on transhumanism, but I still think it's a really cool idea simply because I like stuff like that. But I think if anything, time and at best it could probably be used as a resource like you would oil and it could be manipulated like you you could anything else in the physical world and you could eventually maybe metal it out like you would um you know a bonus or a paycheck or something that i could particularly see that possibly happening but even then what you're really talking about is the present and what you're talking about is an expansion of, of, of everyone's present and how, and how you're able to perceive it. But it's not really that you're given more time. It's just an expression. It's, it's an expansion of your present and what you're able to perceive in it. And I think that's what they're really lo- looking for. And I think once they find how a lot of people call that like the lifting of the veil, I've heard. And, you know, I've heard that guys. I don't know how you would refer to it too, but the present right now is, is, you know, I'm, I'm in a room with four walls or I can walk outside and I can see trees. Well, maybe you could monetize it where you could see or, or you could um, experience something in the present that is wider than what you, you have. And in that way, you've enriched your life. So when your 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 life is at its end, you had a bigger life, you know, and I could see them monetizing that and monetizing your experiences and using that as a new kind of resource that they're probably mining for potentially. Of course, this is all speculation. But yeah, if you could take your present and, and you know, your existence right now and be able to see past, you know, the electromagnetic spectrum and, and the spectrum of light and, and, uh, and be able to experience distances immediately and, and, and you know what we might call teleportation or, or or just see or understand something in your mind in your third eye or whatever it may be and monetize that and say well if you have enough money you can have this kind of experience or or have it all the time isn't that sort of what virtual and augmented reality is yeah and and, and yeah absolutely and that that could be that could be one way to do it i think it's a bit artificial i think that I think it was it was some TED talk where they were talking about they were talking about they've gotten down to such such a level to where it's basically binary code where the fabric of existence itself is is almost like binary code you know ones and zeros and um, you know it would be a far more enriching experience if you could change that code obviously I would think for the good, but obviously it's not going to happen that way. But if you could change that kind of code so people could see more and experience more and have a more meaningful existence, that would be better. Or you're right, have that. And then as another quiet project and then sort of satisfy everyone else with this augmented reality in terms of virtual reality and hooking into your brain and giving you a, an experience that isn't real. So, yeah, but what is really right? So you know, who am I to judge? <laughs> you said something a few minutes ago that kind of made me do a double take. You brought up transhumanism and you said that you've enjoyed that idea. And I've always been sort of against it. It seems like it's combining man and machine for, I guess, more time, right? To sort of live longer. I always say it seems like that sort of went against the natural order of things here on Earth. I've always personally thought that I die when I die and, and I don't want to prolong my life in any way. 
But then I get caught in, in sort of a, a catch-22 where I'm like, well, I'm also like doing what I can to take care of myself now and like eat healthy and, and meditate and do yoga and, and things like that. So that prolongs my life, you know? So I'm not really sure what you mean exactly by transhumanism. If it's the same interpretation of what I have, where it's just a combination of man and AI, but you say that that idea excites you. Why does that? Well, it excites me for, uh, I probably should have said for a couple of reasons. One, because of it's yet another kind of um, promise that's being made. You see what I'm saying? That that science is yet making another promise. And this is the ultimate promise. It never really delivers on the promises that it always makes. It, at least they, everything that science has given us is has been, like I said, sort of a lot of times it's been for military applications, and then they decide to demilitarize it and send it out to the civilian world. And that's only because they wanted better productivity, you know, like like the internet and everything. But for transhumanism, it's yet another promise, like promises were made 100 years ago of living forever. This is yet the, the, the next amusing promise to me. Of, of having, you know, to, to upload your, your consciousness or your soul or whatever to the cloud and all of that. It, if you really listen to all of that, uh, one day these scientists are literally going to take your soul and let you be immortal and upload you to a cloud. They literally call it a cloud. I mean, it's to me that is so amusing <laughs> and so fun yeah. and it's so creative that I, I, I think it's very amusing. However, I do understand that, you know, a lot of the organic technology and a, and a lot of the 3D printing that it, that's out there is very real. And I think for me, so it's kind of it's kind of a, a dual thing that I come at it with is that one side of it, it's the folly that science is yet throwing another kind of whammy on the public where, you know, they, they're going to believe it if they take a certain set of pills or whatever certain set of nano nanobots that they, they let go into their blood system or this CRISPR thing where they're able to alter their DNA. And there's always the promise of something like this. And it never really I mean, it, this goes back to even the 20s when they were talking the earlier forms of like eugenics. They were talking these things and it always turns out to be a disaster. And but but you know what? They they. They do this, they roll something out new, and they do it every hundred years or so. So I guess this is that sort of, um, I think it's W.G. Gann who talks about different financial cycles, and he applied those cycles to human beings, and you could almost use the finance markets to kind of predict through cycles. Not, lin- not, not a linear you know, time passage, but a circular cycle. I think it was W.G. Gann, and he was able to predict when bad things were going to happen through through the financial markets and then and and that was that's a whole other topic that's that's incredibly interesting <laughs> particularly if you believe in a more a, a cycled version of reality versus a linear but um i think you should go into that if if you want because that that is something that i think is relevant to this conversation oh sure yeah there's 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 plenty of of people who wrote lots of books about gan I, i'm trying to look on my shelf i've got I don't have it in front of me. I should have prepared for that. I didn't expect to bring that up. But um, yeah, yeah, in finance, they absolutely know of patterns. They know of cycle, uh, cycles, excuse me. Uh, yeah, there's definitely cycles in, in behavior. You know, that's why they have psychology and economics. And, and yeah, absolutely, human beings, they repeat cycles over and over again. I think there are 20, 40, 100-year cycles. And a lot of that you can play through the market. Um, that goes with Fibonacci as well, um, depend, depending on, on what – on what size of, of the cycle that you want to look on. There's there's like 55-minute cycles, 144-minute cycles, 233-minute cycles, a day, a week. Then it goes all the way into decades. And um, these cycles repeat, and they repeat over and over again in finance and in the markets. I mean, it's not a coincidence that they literally have a, a, a monetary vehicle. They call it futures. I mean, that's not by accident. <laughs> yeah. Right. And the way derivative markets work, particularly whenever you have puts and calls, I mean, it's the perfect way to protect yourself against those things. You buy a stock and everyone who buys stock, they buy a stock and they think, OK, they need the market to perpetually grow, go up. What they what, what they don't tell you is that there's also these things called puts. And these puts are basically what they are. They're shorting the market and they're making sure they bet against the market. Well, no one really who buys a stock for the most part knows that they have puts out there and these puts can be put against the stock as an insurance policy in case the stock doesn't go up. So if the stock tanks, you can make money off of shorting that stock as well. And a lot of hedge funds do that where they play both sides of the market. And all of this is based off of cycles. Man, that's a great explanation. And yeah, I, we weren't prepared to 
to bring that up. But still, I think that's a fascinating anecdote to this conversation. So thanks for explaining that. And back to transhumanism for just a moment, just to tie up that point. If the goal of transhumanism is to sort of cheat death, but in, in your theory, we've already died and we're in the afterlife, what is the goal of transhumanism in this afterlife then? What are they trying to cheat now? Well, I, you know, I, in, in one of my, my talks, I, I, you know, I was playful about it, but I was talking about, you know, you're going to upload yourself into the cloud outside of the echo. You know, there it is. We're going to get out of here. We're going to go in the cloud. We're not going to wait for the echo to dissipate. We're going to upload our consciousness to the cloud and everything's going to be a okay. And and again, they're not trying to align their philosophy with me. So, I mean, I have to align my philosophy with their philosophy. So, um, (laughs) you don't have to, you could just create your own and it just aligns with, with yourself. And yeah, and that's a lot of it too, with, with us being dead. It was more of an exploration exercise than, than anything else. But, but I do, I think that re, that there are some funny things happening with, you know, we, we talked about it with reality and existence and how it's perceived. And there's some really strange things going on right now. So, yeah. Absolutely, man. Back to time real quick too. I was going to ask you if you've seen that movie in time with Justin Timberlake. I'm trying to remember, is that where you buy the time and you have it on your arm? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, time so time like, is like currency in that that film, and that that just the way that you were describing it—that's what it reminded me of. Yeah, and you could do something like that for the for present, you know, the never-ending present. Rather than having more of more time or whatever, you could use that currency to experience pr- the, the present in ways that other people could never experience it. You know, in a lot of ways, we do that now with expensive hotels versus cheap hotels, or expensive cars versus cheap cars. You know, it's a perfect metaphor for that. It's, it, it's all the the very wealthy people they get the very best, and they they get to be safe, and they get to live in a part of town where. You know, they can have private security force, let alone a, a, a police force that, that backs them because they, they support the tax base for everyone else. So imagine doing that for the present. Or if you want to stick with if you think I'm totally out of my mind, sure, yeah, you could do that absolutely for um, a linear-based time, time belief. Yeah, absolutely. One of the other things that fascinates me about time is, is this idea of time travel. And if the future doesn't exist, then you can't travel to it. The past, I think, probably does exist, but or maybe the past doesn't exist. I don't know. But I had a I had a guest on previously that described time to me or time travel rather to me as a resonance travel where each event that's already sort of unfolded in time has its own specific frequency and vibration and that if you can dial into that like maybe psychically or or maybe artificially with some sort of machine perhaps, some sort of AI, that you could travel to that event in time. And I'm, I'm using time in quotation marks here, but you could travel to that, that resonance point. And that goes back to our, you know, what laid the foundation for this conversation and talking about cymatics and sound and the, the true perhaps nature of our universe. And, and I was just wondering if you ever heard that explanation for time travel, that it's more resonance travel and being to travel from, you know, frequency to frequency. Yeah, one of the unlisted videos I have right now addressed it exactly like that, actually. That's really pretty, that's great. That's, you know, talk about synchronicity. I, I explained it as re, a recreation of echoes. And you re, and that's how I put it. But yeah, I like that way too. You recreate the conditions in which those echoes existed and you could absolutely go back to that point and you could experience it. And given that I don't know how the functions of the present work, that by you altering those echoes, would you affect the present? Do, do, do echoes ripple in time? And I, I don't know that because I, but I absolutely believe that you could take, you know, regardless of how you want to, you know, the, the vocabulary you want to use, but you can, you can erect a series of echoes and that, you know, and suddenly you're in, you know, 1947 or whatever it may be. And you are there, you can, the, the sights, the smells, the sounds, everything, you know, the, a wet sidewalk you could smell, you could hear air and tree rustling and the whole thing. And, and you are there. And I totally believe that's possible. Absolutely. Now, that isn't exactly like time travel, like it's presented in where you're physically like, you know, you're going to get into some sort of spaceship or, or whatever, and you 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 actually physically go back there. I don't, I don't believe in that. But yeah, that's great. That's great. Someone else thinks that way. Well, he was a former contractor for some government facilities uh, out in New Mexico, uh, Los Alamos, and uh, what was the other one? Sandia Labs. So he wrote this novel based on his experiences doing this work and the sorts of research that, that they were doing out there. And so his novel is basically a novel of ideas 
built on his own experiences and that's one of the ideas in there so you know is there some actual validity to it well apparently the military industrial complex thinks there is and they've been researching it and pouring millions of our own tax dollars into it so yeah like we've been saying the reality just keeps getting stranger doesn't it which brings us i think to the mandela effect on some level because this is like sort of the the trendy search term that probably a lot of people discover your work through, I would imagine, because it, it has become sort of its own cultural phenomena, so to speak. It's not not necessarily mainstream, and I, I don't hear people on CNN talking about it. I also don't listen to CNN, so I'm not sure if they do. But, but this idea, first of all, I, I'm assuming that most listeners are familiar with it on some level, but I always assume that there are some that, that don't know what it is at all. So can you maybe just describe this phenomenon that's sort of taken the internet by storm in the last few years? Okay. The Mandela effect on its surface is memories that people have, personal memories, and then memories that we have in popular culture. Um, when we go back and we go to look at, at, at artifacts like a movie or something like that, um, they have changed from what our memories are. One of the most popular ones that are out there is the um, Tom Hanks movie, Forrest Gump, where he says, you know, life is like a box of chocolates. Everyone remembers that. And now everybody who is Mandela affected, they believe that that they remember it as, as life is like a box of chocolates. The way it is in the movie is life was like a box of chocolates. The same thing with uh, Mirror, Mirror on the Wall is now Magic Mirror on the Wall. Uh, Luke, I am your father is now no, I am your father. And that's really just the, the real basic kind of 101 top level sort of scratch the surface of, of what the Mandela effect is. When you get deeper into the Mandela effect, you start seeing that. And a lot of this I don't hold as much validity to because I understand advertising changes. A lot of people really get um, worked up over product changes and the spelling of different products and the way products that they they remembered in the past, how how they've changed. So you have an entertainment component, you have a commercial component to it, and then the one that bothers me just as much as the entertainment component are geographical changes. One of the most famous and, and one is that the is that South America has moved over and used to be south of, of, of America and it's not. You know, it's 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 the the absolute west coast of, of South America now is is basically just below Florida. And at one point, many people believed that South America was literally that it was south. It was it was under Mexico and the U.S. And that the um, the way in which Central America goes from east to west used to go more. It was more north to south. And also that Australia, one of the more popular ones, is Australia used to be a lot farther out and by itself rather than closer to um, Papua New Guinea. And also to New Zealand used to be in a different place. And a lot of people claim that there was another island, not as big as Australia, but it was, it was substantial and it was somewhere near or in the Indian Ocean and that's gone now. Also, too, a lot of people remember there being a North Pole and that it was frozen. And now the North Pole is somewhere in Alaska and none of the maps or none of the older globes has a um, North Pole or has a, a, a permanent, you know, ice glacier or whatever you want to call it. You know, that's gone. Those, those I think are the most, I find the most fascinating, but I am, I'm no expert with anything like that i have my personal memory a lot of things with the mandela effect um they are patterns where people's names were once plural or they had an s at the end of the name are now singular or they have no s at the end of the name such as sally field i remember her as sally fields that was a big deal and it was a big deal because my mom was a fan of sally field so growing up we always watched her movies anything she was in we would watch with her so i specifically remember sally fields and whether it was even, you know, the Flying Nun or Gidget or whatever it was, she was always around in our house. And I remember that name. And so that was very strange for me and started to get me interested in it. And then um, her famous Oscar speech, you know, you like me, you really, really like me. There's a lot of what people in the Mandela Effect community call residue, where other people like Tim, uh, um, uh, Jim Carrey in The Mask, where he, he memes that, you know, saying you like me, you really, really like me. And she never said that now. Now she's saying, you like me now, you like me now, or something like that. It, it's something that doesn't make a lot of sense. Also, too, with the Mandela effect, 
um, and this is the more disturbing and something that I haven't experienced, is um, uh, personalities of, of those around them, coworkers or even loved ones, which is more um, disturbing, that they've become different people. Their, their values, their morals, their, their approach to life, everything about them has changed. Or even the most disturbing, I've only heard about this, is family members have gone missing and people have gone mad trying to, you know, go from family member to family member saying, I had this number of children or I had this number of, of siblings and the family doesn't remember this person. So it goes from whatever I've experienced from the very odd and strange and kind of a head scratching thing to where I think it's very, very interesting all the way deep down to where it's it's very disturbing. Yeah, that would be disturbing. I hadn't heard of that last part there that you were just talking about in terms of people going missing and personalities changing. And I've done a lot of you know reading and, and listening to other people talk about things like, you know, mind control. That could be the cause of personality changes. And I've seen a lot of other stories about, you know, people disappearing, just maybe being abducted by the military industrial complex, you know. So there could be some other explanations that are, you know, maybe not as paranormal as to why those sorts of things are happening. But to the events that most people may be familiar with in terms of the entertainment stuff, you know, with the Star Wars line, the Forrest Gump line, you know, the Berenstain, Berenstein thing, which is what turned me on to this whole thing. Those sorts of things do have a a seemingly paranormal or supernatural aspect to them. What are some of the other explanations that you've seen out there that, that you're aware of as to why this phenomenon may be occurring to begin with? Well, I mean, the big one out there is CERN. Because that a lot of people believe it's CERN. That's, that's, the, big, that's the big one. And that one, you'll get about 90% of, of... And by the way, there are uh, Mandela Effect communities on Facebook. Most of them are private, where people can go. And they sort of describe it as, as, as a condition or an affliction that they have. And they, particularly people who are, have the more severe conditions of... And they call it ME, who have ME... They, they have groups out there to, uh, to, to help them cope with losing a family member or, or people saying a particular set of events didn't happen. So I wanted to just throw that out there. I'm not a member of any of those. I just, I'm aware of them and I'm sympathetic to people who think or, or who know in, in their minds that, that they, they lost someone this way. But anyway, the big, the big theory that's out there is CERN. And, you know, they, they did a rip in time or CERN sort of has this secondary purpose to what it states publicly. And that there's some video out there with CERN where someone, uh, one of the scientists, he has a, a billboard with like Bond and some other words. And then he has Mandela on it. And it's a playful video uh, that CERN put out there. And a lot of people take that as uh, they take offense to the video because they think that CERN changed the past and has been tinkering with the past to see how it, it would affect the present time. And, and they're almost putting it in people's faces that they are making these changes and that they're, they're acknowledging they make the changes. Particularly how it all started out with is the Mandela, is, is Nelson Mandela. And apparently a whole swath of, of the planet believes he died in the 80s in jail. Another swath like me, you know, they remember him going on to be the South African president and, and dying recently here. And I don't remember it was 2012, 2013, something like that. So that that that's where it began with. And the fact that the CERN video um, and, and it's a dated video, it's an older video. It's not something that came out in like the last year or the last six months or something. The fact that that, that video had this particular science uh, scientist holding up a placard that says Mandela, it's almost as if. A lot of people kind of put those two things together that they were the ones that did this. Now, I do have to say that this all began with a, um, a personality named, uh, I believe it's Fiona Broom, um, who, for, yeah. who first, I believe she coined the phrase. And if she didn't coin the phrase, she certainly brought it sort of into the zeitgeist. And from there, and I believe that was well before uh, 2012, but from there it's been... It's been growing more and more and more. I think tr what really trips people up is particularly the entertainment things and the things that they remember from their childhood, like, you know, Mirror, Mirror on the Wall versus Magic Mirror. Oh, and then there's, oh gosh, and then there's a whole entire section of Christians. They believe that uh, the Mandela Effect is changing the Bible. And I, I, f I follow a lot of those channels on YouTube because I just find that so fascinating. And these are people who are passionate about understanding the Bible. And, you know, there, there's things I even remember about the Bible, you know, with the Lord's Prayer changing um, and then with um, the, the, the lines uh, uh, laying down with the lamb. And now it's, um, you know, the wolf 
lay down with the lamb and there's all kinds of other and they're almost finding them daily from the king james version uh particularly the christian community there's a huge community of so um you have disparate communities reacting in different ways and growing in different ways to this thing and if it's a psyop then it's a great psyop because it's working (laughs) well that's the problem too with you know digitizing everything in the cloud is that it can be changed it can be manipulated you know if if the bible doesn't exist as a physical book anymore and most people just read it through an app or as an ebook you know then anybody could go in there and change the text of it at any point so there are some you know know more logical explanations i think for those sorts of things and it is intriguing that that there are that it is sort of affecting people who may not otherwise believe in these sorts of supernatural occurrences for example yeah and i think for me um one why the christian one for me is so fascinating is that these are people who are just brand new to anything alternative or anything um conspiratorial or and they're interested in nothing else. And as far as the, the, the digital, why the Christian thing, too, is also very interesting to me is that a lot of them are talking about physical Bibles, not digital. And they make the claims that their their old King James Version has changed, as in the words in mm. the physical page. Right. So th- those I find the most fascinating, particularly people who who have studied the Bible and are it's very much a part of their lives there and and they're so passionate you know but everything else like you're talking about absolutely they could have did digitally changed every copy of a particular movie that is that is completely within the realm of possibility sure that's sure well but i do well, i'm sorry go ahead no i was just gonna say i'm i'm wondering if you know there's somebody out there that for example has an old vhs copy of forrest gump or star wars and compares it to like a newer you know dvd or blu-ray of it or a digital copy of it to see if it really has changed yeah there's lots of stories like that who they they take out old their old vcr they dust it off they plug it into an old tv and it has changed so particularly like i heard the one story of a uh i I think it was dvd i don't think it was vhs but it was a video where the person was talking about, yeah, it changed to life was like a box of chocolates versus life is like a box of chocolates. Hmm. And then um, if you will build it, he will come versus if you build it, they will come. Uh, for I think it's filled of dreams. I didn't see that movie. I'm just saying it's a lot. And I, so I don't know. I don't have any memories of that. But there are entire people who, who claim that if, if you take a VHS or you take a, uh, an older DVD version, that it too has changed. But you know, I, I can't prove that. I, I don't, you know, so. Yeah, that is curious. I, I've not looked up any videos like that. But, I mean, if I have that thought, I'm sure there are many others that have, obviously. So, yeah, and I don't have any VHS tapes anymore. You know, that's the problem, too, with with this whole transhumanism approach is that we get rid of all of these tangible things that, that we grew up with, for example. You know, like people our age grew up with VHS tapes. We grew up with cassette tapes. We grew up with actual physical books. And we're getting rid of them all. They're being replaced by things. And then who knows what the Bible is going to read like in 50 years. Oh, absolutely. Oh, you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh, oh. But there is one interesting one. And I, and, and again, I'm just bringing this up. I'm saying that, that, that I believe this particular one. There's the one with I think it's um, with Sinbad. And there's an entire group of, of, of Mandela affected people who believe that he was in some sort of movie. I think it was called um, Shazam. That's it. That's the one. There it is. Yeah. So there's there's so many disparate components to this thing so and that's why i find it so fascinating versus other conspiracy theories people who are conspiracy theory minded are 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 going to be in it you know jfk the whole you know just just whatever it may be there'll be conspiracy minded and open to conspiracies this thing it i've i've never experienced anything like this where you have people who never even wanted to hear about this are, are are getting hysterical over changes over the Bible and things like that. You know, there was one video I saw of a pastor with months and months ago. He started breaking down and crying because he knew his Bible had changed. And this was him talking to his parishioners. So this really mattered to him and it made he believed that this was happening. So it's pretty amazing. It's pretty astonishing if you go through some of the some of the videos there, particularly in the last two two years or so. It seems to be and that's another thing. It seems to be picking up in the changes to where to where there's entire philosophies now, right? They call them old earthers versus new earthers. They think that we that we switched from an old version of Earth 
and now we're in a new version of Earth, and we did it sometime around 2012. Obviously, I'm in the mix saying that we all died, but you know, my stuff is a bit more tongue in cheek. However, I mean, it's possible. But there are people, there are diehards who truly believe that we're on a new version of Earth, and that we 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 changed. I think from the Orion. I think it's the. I don't want to say this wrong because I. I it's the Orion Spur, and now we're in the Sagittarius side of of, of things, and and we've changed. Our, our sort of galactic position in in you know the universe and and they believe that we we switched so there's all kinds of of, of camps out there in, in believing what happened but a lot of people believe it has something to do with CERN and D wave and quantum computing and things of that nature. I think too what this does is if you experience it or if you have experienced it, it forces you to really consider the nature of your own reality and how it may be. I think the term that I've used down here before that you see in the occult is it's it's mutable, it's it's transmutable, it's transformable, and I think this effect is starting to prove that to a lot of people, and it's it's almost like that. It's a forced consideration or, or a forced reconsideration, whereas, you know, if you studied something like the occult on your own, you would come to this sort of realization through the works that you've exposed yourself to. But then there's the flip side where this effect and things like it are sort of forcing people to consider it, you know, like sort of against their will almost. Yeah, and that, that is, that's, a, that's a great distinction you made there. And, and for me, too, I'll, I'll readily and openly admit, I probably wouldn't have started my YouTube channel if it wasn't for the Mandela Effect and, and it affecting me in terms of me really reconsidering. Because I would have never thought of that. You know, what if the world ended? What if we all died in 2012? And I would have never put Terrence McKenna's work together with him saying that, that history ends in 2012 and everything started to come, come to my mind. And, you know, the Higgs boson was 2012 and putting all these, these random things together. I, I, I can tell you, I can honestly tell you, if it wasn't for the Mandela effect and me remembering these things a certain way all the way from my childhood to my adulthood and, and it really shaking me up, I would have never considered doing anything that I'm doing. So it's changed me. So again, if this is a psyop and it's true and they're they're tracking with you know whatever it is they do, you know yeah I'm changed and 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 I am. I'm, I, it makes you reconsider the fabric of the of your reality. It, it makes you rethink of life, death, and everything else in the middle. And it really does change you. It's changed me. I freely admit that. And and yeah, this wasn't something that I sought out. This was something that was forced on me. Um, this was something that I didn't I didn't seek out or, or even want. I, I think for me. I think I'm, I feel blessed that I have the tool set that I already had in place of things like the power of now, of my understanding of the nature of existence already, it being kind of um, a little less structured than a lot of people who, who are dealing with this and they're not dealing quite as well with it. And I think that I, I may have had a better tool set mentally to deal with this than a lot of people I'm seeing online who become hysterical over it. Yeah, and to go back to that point that you made about what Terrence McKenna said. I've been playing a lot recently with words and, and language, and I just had this thought while you were talking about him and what he said, you know, history ends in 2012, and I've seen some great interpretations of history as a word, and some people break it down into two words and say his story, which is a, an, a sort of external third person account of something. And now we're talking about the Mandela effect after 2012, or, you know, maybe shortly before that, that it started. And we're talking about a real mystery, which I've seen people break down into my story. Mm. And yeah, so it makes me just sort of wonder, like, we have undergone some sort of transition, obviously. I don't think there's any debate about that. There's some sort of, of humanistic transition here, whether it's specific to human beings or if it's an earth thing or a universe thing i don't know but i do think that you know you see this online if you're on youtube watching people talk all the time or listening to podcasts then you will stumble on people talking about being awake being conscious now and what that does is it it sort of reintroduces yourself to yourself and brings back that individuality that spirituality that, that we've been lacking. And that's where the, the, the his story versus my story really starts to intrigue me is that this transition, maybe it was about someone else 
or something else previously, but now it's about each individual's story. And that, that to me is maybe a more spiritual way to look at this whole phenomenon that's been occurring since, since, you know, 2012 or, or roughly thereabout is that it, we've had, we've undergone this transition from it being about external authorities to now it's just about us as, as individuals and focusing on our own path and our own journey. I was a long tangent there and I'm sorry, but it just seems like that is, sort of what we're talking about in terms of maybe from a, you know, if you go beyond fear and conspiracy and, and those things that are really just meant to sort of control you and keep you in, in order, it's about reclaiming that chaos, which I know is an idea that you're familiar with. You've talked about that. I've talked about that recently too, about sort of reclaiming your spirit, which is chaotic in nature and that the universe at large is chaotic. So I think this is all just sort of starting to tie together for a lot of people. Yeah. And I think that, uh, with it, you know, if you if you watch a lot of mainstream news and, and things of that nature, you, you'll, you'll see a lot of chaos and you'll see a lot of people that are very upset for one reason or another. And I think that that's all part of this. And I think that that's a part of, you know, kind of tying this back that that the crumbling of what is what is the truth and the crumbling of this vertical thinking and the crumbling of all of these older ideas and this is cyclical too and that's why i'm not i'm suspicious that cern did something malevolent to us that you know to where they're manipulating the past how do we know that the mandela effect this isn't a natural occurrence that happens this isn't a natural transition that happens you know it happens all the time perhaps you know we don't know that so i think that if we can accept things where through intuition and and using other tools that we've abandoned so long ago and that's i think is one of the nefarious natures of science where it even incorporated its own religion called materialism where anything outside the, the physical world is basically you know hocus pocus i think if we can reincorporate some of those tools that we lost long ago into this i think we'll be better equipped to understand what's happening and i think that we'll have a better understand uh, understanding of what's happening and that way you can better embrace chaos and you can better embrace you know the fact that the foundations in which that you were brought up with in terms of of, of how things are going to play out they may not play out the way in which that, that that you think or you think should be there's this movie called the counselor and um at the end of the movie the main character he's trying to set up a drug deal and um he's a lawyer and it went horribly wrong and it's just this brilliant speech at the end of the movie where the, the drug lord is explaining to him about his loved one being dead. And he's trying to explain it to him is, is that you're not letting go and that there's this subjective world. And I'm probably butchering it to death. So please go see the movie. It's a wonderful movie. And the end, and the end justifies that the rest of the movie is not very eventful, but the end in this speech was so powerful. And he talks about, you know, the pain you're feeling is just, it's your ego not letting go with the reality of the situation that has already happened. It's already there and it already exists. And the only, the only, by you bargaining with me still after I've already told you that these events have taken place is, is you bargaining with yourself and you being upset with yourself and that the world itself is going to move on regardless of what you think. And the world is going to do what it's going to do regardless of what you want. And to, and to find peace with yourself, you're going to have to stop arguing with yourself. You're going to have to just, just stop that conversation in your head. Silence your head. Embrace mindlessness. You know, I was always brought up to be mindful and it was the worst thing ever. The, the best thing ever is to be mindless. Let, let go of those scenarios. Let go of those arguments you have in your head and just let there be silence for a while. And just live right now in the now. And even if you can only do it five minutes a day, you know, do it for yourself. And you know, that that wasn't that wasn't part of the movie. That was me dove, just dovetailing into my own how I try to live. But you know, it's such a powerful scene in the movie, and it was really cool. And I think it um, probably one of the greatest scenes I've ever seen in, in, in movie history. Well, and I'm right there with you, man, on, in terms of being mindless. You know, we've always been told that losing your mind is a bad thing. But when you really study how the mind works, losing it is a is a is a freeing and and quite liberating thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I agree. I, the best thing I've ever, you know, the best compliment I ever put, I paid to myself is, is saying, you know what, I'm going to just be quiet for a little while in my head and just just stop. 
You know, that's the, the greatest gift you can give to yourself. Not a vacation, not a physical place to take yourself to. And, you know, I know, I, I you know, I'm not trying to sound new agey or, or, you know, wishy washy. I mean, these are survive, these are hard survival skills that, that I'm, I'm trying to communicate. And these are, these are, these are hard skills that you could teach yourself to where you can live more at peace and possibly, you know, avoid disease, avoid a lot of, 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 of self-inflicted trauma. You know, it doesn't have to be new agey. You can toss out part of the power now where it gets, you know, spiritual and just, just go with the mental exercises where you physically work on shutting down your brain and, and, and it does such wonders. It's such a wonderful thing to do for a treat for yourself. It's, it's better than a day at the spa. <laughs> for sure, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, it's a good point to wrap up on is just that a lot of people out there, I think are, are clinging to the ideas of what they want things to be like, instead of just letting go and embracing the way things are, you know, they're, they're sort of clinging to their own personal order yes. instead of just embracing the way things are, which is, which is quite chaotic and just kind of turning themselves over to that process. You know, chaos doesn't necessarily, it's not negative. It's just random. It's just unknown. It's just, there is no order. And that I think it goes back to the idea of vertical thinking versus lateral thinking is that vertical is very orderly. It's very sort of laid out for you step by step. Whereas lateral is, like I said, flexible. It's sort of this elusive way of thinking where you're not tied to one specific philosophy, for example, or one specific outcome to a certain situation. It's just sort of, you just kind of make of things as they come. And, and I think that's, hopefully that's a good way to sort of wrap this up. So this has been a great conversation, man. I do appreciate your time, but we got to get out of here. SMQ, tell people where they can find your work, please. Oh, sure. Um, on YouTube, uh, you can just, you can look me, look me up as SMQ. Um, that's where, that's where I mostly play. Uh, if you want to check me out on Twitter, uh, that would be great. I'm at um, AI underscore SNQ. Uh, and those are really the two places that I, I my, my public facing place is where, where I'm at. Um, and I would, yeah, I would appreciate everybody stopping by and checking out my videos. I would recommend they do the same. And by the way, congratulations. We should have mentioned this, that, that you had a short film just accepted into a very prestigious independent film festival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was one of the uh, it was one of the videos that I took off of um, that I took that that I took private. I, I went ahead and I sent it into a series of film festivals, and and yeah, it's an official selection of the London Independent Film Awards for 2017. So it was shocking, and it was it was it was the best thing ever, and I totally didn't ex uh, expect it. I I just knew that I had all of these these videos where I started using visuals on private, and I just didn't know what to do with them. And you know, I've taken them since I've taken them off private, as you know, and I now have them I have them where you have to have the link, and I'm not sharing them with the public, but certainly eventually if this thing goes farther in other film festival or well certainly even with the selection i'll eventually probably let it go public again and let people watch it good luck with that and again thanks for your time regardless of the nature of it i do appreciate it and uh, it's been really nice chatting with you excellent well thank you very much for having me i appreciate it sha fucking zam my thanks again to SMQ. Check out the links to his work in the show notes if you want more of his sweet, sweet philosophical action. A lot of great stuff in there, I thought. I particularly enjoyed the bits about creativity and art as magic and the muses. As someone who fancies himself as a creative and an artist from time to time, I often forget that I don't have to be communing with spirits directly to perform magic and that things I do regularly, like writing or even podcasting, is itself an act of creation and is thus magic. Although the whole conscious communing with spirits thing probably does enhance the art, but that's what the muse is anyway. It's a spirit transmitting a message to you that you ultimately put out into the world in the form of a book or a film or a painting or a rather pedestrian fringe podcast. And then there's this whole 2012 thing. And let's get the Mayan calendar horse shit out of the way because every time 2012 comes up, that's where my mind goes. The Mayans were not keeping time based on our current Gregorian calendar model, so their 2012 was never our 2012. Okay? Cool? Alright. That said, what is their 2012? I've seen references to three different Gregorian years, 2016, 2017, and 2020. Honestly, I don't know which of these is more accurate, and at this point, I don't even care. Because time isn't even real. But the calendar is here as a reference tool for us, and using it, going back in time, 
I definitely saw a change in myself in 2012. I can trace my own lateral thinking back to that time frame. 2012 is the X that marks the spot on my map. Sandy Hook got me woke, and that's also around the time I saw Berenstein had been wiped from history. By the way, if you type Berenstein into a Word doc, it'll underline it red as if it's misspelled. No, dickheads, I did not mean Berenstein. And if you don't believe me, I posted a photo of it on the show's Instagram feed, at oculture underscore podcast, and on Twitter, at oculturepod. It really does underline it. But of course, I am curious what you guys think of all this. What do you make of SMQ's 2012 theory? Did we all experience a collective death in the recent past? Perhaps we're stuck in a weird purgatorial state. Maybe we're in the middle of a Lost episode. And what's really going on here with the Mandela effect? Sinister science experiment or false collective memory? So many questions, so little t- Ah, hold up. That's a myth. Hey, if you liked what you heard, please do consider supporting the show at oculturepodcast.com slash support. We'll take any spare change you got, any Bitcoin you want to part with. Every cent helps because we're trying to turn this into more than just a part-time thing, more than just a weekly thing, and more than just a podcast thing. I'm coming for more of that free time. I got plans. Faux show. For example, I just posted a new blog over at OcultrePodcast.com slash blog from David Halpin. He's on Twitter at Occult Review. Some of you may follow him. He's on Instagram at The Occult Book Review. The blog post is called Psychnosis or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Archon. It's a pretty cool read. I'll link that in the show notes if you're interested. But I'd like to bring in more voices like that to the Oculture family. And the donations do help with that because then, you know, maybe I can dangle some spare change at them, you know? Because I, I hate accepting people's work for free. I would love to pay them. And the people that have helped me put this stuff together, whether it's podcasts or blogs, they're so generous with their time and their talent. And I would love to compensate them in the future. So, you know, you wouldn't just be helping me out. You'd be helping out potential contributors down the line. So click on through to the support link and tickle my old feel spot with a donation or two. And that wraps up another one here for me. Thank you so much for hanging out. Until next time, you've just been initiated into old culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.